Welcome to the Psych Central Show, where each episode presents an in-depth look at issues from the field of psychology and mental health, with host Gabe Howard and co-host Vincent M. Wales. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of the Psych Central Show podcast. My name is Gabe Howard, and I'm here with my fellow host, Vincent M. Wales. And today, we have a very, I'm going to go with unique guest. Not because he himself is unique, although he's hes a rather, rather cool guy, but because his experience is unique to mental health shows. Let me give a little background. Early In the early days of the Psych Central show, Vin and I used to do Gabe and Vin only shows. Remember those, Vin, way back when? Oh, yeah. And one of the first episodes we did was Vin interviewing me about my experience in a psychiatric hospital. I was in the psych ward of a, mm-hmm. of a hospital again as, as a patient and how I felt about it. And then a, a year or so later with the launch of a bipolar, a schizophrenic, and a podcast, me and Michelle Hammer, who lives with schizophrenia, we both talked about our experiences inpatient and we got a lot of feedback from a lot of people that said, yeah, it was traumatizing. Being a patient sucked. Everybody was mean to us and it was just an awful experience. And Michelle and I said, yeah, yeah, it was terrible. We didn't like any of it. And then I was talking to my friend Gabe, who we'll introduce here in a minute. And he said, you know, that that's very one-sided. You know, people who work there, they have an opinion. And the exact phrase that he used was psychiatric hospitals are traumatizing for everybody. There's nobody that really escapes the trauma of these places. They're just scary places for everyone. And that really is worth investigating more. So without further ado, Gabe, Nathan, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. Thank you. Now, first, in in interest of full disclosure, you currently do not work for a psychiatric hospital, but you worked there for a number of years. I, yes, I worked at an inpatient crisis psychiatric hospital for five years. And inpatient is people, they're admitted there, sometimes voluntarily, sometimes against their will. It's the locked door. They have to be probated to leave. They sleep there. Yeah, there are, there are many locked doors. And uh, <laughs> at, at our facility, it's a freestanding, independent, locked crisis psychiatric hospital. And the majority of our patients uh, were involuntary, but there were a mix of voluntary and involuntary patients. If you were brought there on an involuntary hold in Pennsylvania, where I worked, it's called a 302. You are there for up to 120 hours. Uh, You have a hearing in front of a mental health review officer. Sometimes there are people who testify about your behavior. The treating psychiatrist testifies. You can testify. You have a public defender. Uh, If the mental health review officer believes you need more time, get more time. That's, That's how it goes. And when people think of psychiatric hospitals and psychiatric wards, this fits, right? I mean, yeah, I I can, I can give you like a general feel of the facility where I work. You know, it had institutional furniture, you know, the stain resistant industrial vinyl, very, very heavy chairs because, you know, sometimes people get angry and like to throw chairs. So we try to mitigate that with, you know, heavy furniture. You've got the ligature free everything. Yeah, everything is is reviewed. So we had what's called environmental rounds where staff members patrol the hallways and and actually look for things. Could this be potentially a ligature point? Could this be used to harm someone? Mm -hmm. We had sometimes wicker furniture that people would pick off the pieces of wicker and and use that to to cut themselves. So, you know, you you had to be looking for everything. Mm -hmm. The art that was on the walls is in covered in plexiglass that is screwed to the wall, like the frame is screwed to the wall because um, we would have patients rip the artwork off the wall and you know try to break the plexiglass to hurt themselves. If you were writing, you'd have these little bendy pens that were nearly impossible for you to hurt yourself with, little tiny little golf pencils. So the entire environment is regularly scrutinized and quote therapeutic milieu, which is the term that's used to describe the inpatient environment is all designed to keep people safe from themselves or or others. I have a couple specific questions. Since I work in the hospital end of things myself here, did your hospital have a psychiatric ER? Okay, so th- this was a psychiatric emergency facility. So okay. we would have cops roll up at you know three a.m. with yeah. people, ambulances. We in fact uh, have one of the only dedicated psychiatric ambulances. It's based yeah. out of our hospital. So when a warrant is issued, it's EMTs along with the police serving that warrant, so that it's not the police showing up to the house. It's not the person being handcuffed and thrown in the back of a patrol car like a criminal. Right. It's it's more. 
trauma aware. Um, not to say that it's not traumatizing to be dragged out of your house at 3 a.m., whether it's by EMTs or cops or whomever, but it, it looks a little better to the neighbors. Sure. So Gabe, what was your position there? What was your job? When I was hired in 2010, I was a hybrid of psych tech, so which is really like your lowest rung. Sometimes they're called psychiatric aides. They're really the backbone of any psychiatric hospital. They're doing rounds. They're checking the bathroom to make sure people are you know, not doing inappropriate things in there or harming themselves in there. Uh, they're checking every single room. They are monitoring the hallways. They're everywhere. And there's usually okay. you know eight to 10 on duty per shift. So I did that a couple days a week, and then a couple days a week, I was what's called an allied therapist. Basically, my job as an allied therapist was to facilitate a wide range of psychoeducational and recreational groups for the patients. So at 11 o'clock, I could be running Coping with Anxiety. At 1 o'clock, I could be running Creative Writing or Current Events, and then doing a lot of documentation and conducting like one-on-one -on -one interviews with patients just to see how they were doing that day. So that was what I did okay. for three years. And then I moved up to development and programming. And I did that for two years. Okay. And one last hospital question. How large was it? How many beds did you have? So at the time I was working there, we had a 73 bed capacity. Oh. So let's talk about differences between patients and staff. So one of the things that you just talked about is all of these things are done to keep patients safe. What was the word that you use? Therapeutic? Milieu. Mill you okay? So the mill you, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking purely as a patient, you're constantly staring at people and trying to see if they're up to anything, and it appears very infantilizing. And you're talking down to us, and you're you're constantly treating us like we're not adults. That's very much what I felt when I was there. How do you feel about that? Not like why is it done? I think we all understand why it's done, but how did you, Gabriel Nathan, feel? Sort of. I'm trying not to say babysitting adults, but in a way, you're responsible for keeping adults safe who don't appreciate it. How does sure. that make you feel? We're responsible for keeping people safe who have demonstrated that they, they do not possess that ability. Yes. self safe. Agreed. Agreed. So unfortunately, it's, it's a warranted reality. And we were often being confronted with people saying, F you, you've got no right to, to be watching over me and, you know, whatever, when they just tried to throw themselves in front of a bus. So there was often a, a disconnect there. And I tell people the most commonly uttered phrase in the hospital is, I don't belong here. Okay. Yeah. And that was said by a great number of people. It was said by very wealthy, well-to-do individuals who I guess were saying it because they didn't belong with, you know, kind of the impoverished, psychotic individual, you know, who was wearing newspaper underwear, right? So they, they felt this kind of righteous indignation of I don't belong here. But it was said by everyone, <laughs> mm -hmm. regardless of their socioeconomic status or whether or not they used illicit substances or what, nobody belonged there. Um, even when we were at capacity, we, no one belonged there. Yeah, you had um, no reason to exist. Exactly, right. So how did Gabriel Nathan feel in that position? I think uncomfortable is the word. I felt uncomfortable for quite a few reasons. First of all, I did not have a lot of psychiatric training when I was initially hired for this job, and I felt uncomfortable about that, where I was feeling like I was a fish out of water. Okay. That makes sense. So I felt uncomfortable that way. I felt uncomfortable you know, being someone of relatively slight build, being put in a position where uh, the alarm would go off. And, uh, you know, if you're the first one who's arriving at whatever emergency it is, like, you've got to deal with it. You don't have a lot of tools at your disposal to deal with issues in an inpatient psychiatric hospital. And so I felt kind of outmuscled, and that got uncomfortable several times. And I also felt uncomfortable because the whole environment is it's bizarre. You, you really feel like you're in a bizarro world. You're with individuals, some of whom are psychotic, some of whom are reality-based, some of whom are suicidal, some who have severe depression and anxiety or inability to care. It, it is a, a huge mix of individuals. Because of the makeup of our hospital, it wasn't divided into separate units. Like this is the bipolar unit and this is the right, schizophrenia right. unit. And it was just everyone mm -hmm. pretty much Definitely. together. So facilitating, let's say, creative writing group, when you have individuals who are psychotic and, and actively responding to internal stimuli and people who are reality-based, or it was very, very difficult and very frustrating at times 
And I, I want to address the point too about, it feels like everyone's watching us. It feels that way for staff too. Don't forget that we're on camera also. When you get called up to HR, you're you're feeling it, okay? It's like being because called to the principal's office. It's, right? Well, it's like being called to the principal's office, but the stakes are so high mm -hmm. because unfortunately at the hospital, you are going hands-on with people. A, a woman comes out of her room stark naked and there's three male employees around. And you, you have to manage that situation and that gets very problematic. Mm -hmm, <laughs> so yeah. um, we are being watched as well as employees. And I, and I used to run one of the groups I would run is called, uh, it was called a safety group. And we would talk about the hospital. I would talk very frankly. I would let them know, yeah, you are on camera 24 hours a day. The only places we don't have cameras are your bedrooms and the bathroom. But other than that, you're being watched all the time. So it's not paranoia. Like I was very frank about it. Mm -hmm. But I also emphasized we are too. And that is for your safety as well. You've got to watch everyone. We're going to step away for a moment to hear from our sponsor. We'll be right back. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp.com. Secure, convenient, and affordable online counseling. All counselors are licensed, accredited professionals. Anything you share is confidential. Schedule secure video or phone sessions, plus chat and text with your therapist whenever you feel it's needed. A month of online therapy often costs less than a single traditional face-to-face -face session. Go to BetterHelp.com forward slash Psych Central and experience seven days of free therapy to see if online counseling is right for you. BetterHelp.com forward slash Psych Central. Welcome back, everyone. We're here with Gabriel Nathan talking about what it's like to work in a psych hospital. Gabriel, when you worked there, did you feel personally scared? Were you ever afraid? I mean, you talked about being nervous or being you know, worried about HR or feeling watched, but did you ever fear for your own physical self or, or emotional self while an employee there? Yes. You know, the first time I ever got punched in the face was at the hospital. That was like a unique experience. And you actually do see stars, or I, I did, like little bursts of light. Um, mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, I thought that was just a cartoon thing. <laughs> That's real. I got attacked during uh, what's called, we called it an elopement attempt. I was the only one there, and that really sucked. And that was a turning point in my time there. That, what, that, ha what happened exactly? I, I will tell the story exactly as I, I can tell it. Um, it was it was September seventeenth, two thousand twelve, and you don't you just don't forget this stuff. I, it was a Monday morning, and uh, I worked every other weekend when I was on the unit, and this was my weekend off. So I was coming in on Monday fresh. I didn't know the patients who had been admitted over the weekend. Morning report had not happened yet, so I, I didn't get the skinny on you know who was who. And I was preparing the paperwork for the allied therapy department. And there's a lot of paperwork from the weekend that you just have to get together and put in every patient's chart and everything. And you have to make photocopies. So the photocopies are used for morning report and the originals are put in the charts. So the copier in the chart room was broken. It was always broken. It was a pain in the ass. So I had to take all the originals and go out to the crisis lobby because they had a, a photocopier. So I go out of the chart room and there was a young man in his like early 20s, white guy, t-shirt, shorts, standing by the door to the crisis lobby. And there's a red and white lines in a square by the door to signal like stand outside of this box. Like you're not allowed to stand inside the box. And he was standing inside the box and I was like, oh great, you know, first thing in the morning, I'm gonna have to tell this guy you can't stand by the door. It's gonna be a confrontation. But as I was walking towards him, he moved outside of the box. Still like near the door, but I was like, oh, okay, he, he did the right thing. I don't have to say anything to him. I nodded my head. I said, good morning. He looked at me and I put my key in the door and I opened the door and I felt him right behind me. And I turned around. I had my keys in my hand and the papers and I said no. And he said, let me in there. And he shoved against the door and I was shoving back, trying to close the door on him. And I was standing on a mat like that you wipe your feet on. And the mat was sliding back on the floor. And I was like, I I'm going to lose it. I he shoved his way through and he bear hugged me and pushed me up against the wall. And I'm thinking, uh, just stay on your feet. All you have to do is stay on your feet and... 20 seconds, there's going to be 10 guys in here, right? So I'm wrestling with him, and he I had a hoodie on, which if you ever work in a psychiatric hospital, don't wear a hoodie. <laughs> okay. Okay. And I never, ever did. This was the day. So I had this stupid hoodie on. He reaches over the back of me and pulls the hoodie over my head, 
So now I can't see anything. I hear screaming, someone hits the psych alarm, I can hear the bell, and then the next thing I know, I'm on the floor, and I can feel people on top of me, and I'm like, oh, great. They, they took him to the floor, and we're all on the floor together, and they're going to pull him off me, and it's all going to be over. Well, uh, what I didn't realize until I watched the video was when he had pulled my hoodie over me and someone activated the alarm, it was actually a patient who hit the alarm. He immediately got off me when the other staff came in, and staff took me to the floor, not him. And he, he faded back and was just watching with the other patients. And a nurse came in with a trilogy, which is a needle with Haldol, Benadryl, and Ativan, to give to me. And I was face down on the floor with my head covered with the hoodie. And she looked at me and said, oh my God, he's got a belt on. Why does he have a belt on? How am I going to give him the needle? Because obviously when you come into a psych hospital, they take your belt. Right. So the guy who's on top of me pulled my hoodie up and he said, Gabe? And I'm on the floor staring at one of my colleagues. And he said, what is going on? And I said, young guy, white t-shirt, gray shorts. And they found the guy and put him in restraints and gave him the trilogy. That's how that incident went down. And wow. um, that sucked. And after they had brought me up and after I had explained what happened, all my coworkers are standing around and they're trying to comfort me or whatever and you just see me I take my glasses off and I throw them against the wall as hard as I can and I took that stupid hoodie off and I throw it against the wall and I was just so incensed that I didn't get saved like it didn't go down the way it was supposed to right, you know yeah. um, the way I had been there for colleagues it, right. it didn't didn't pan out for me I, I want to make it very clear there are colleagues who have been hurt way, way worse. You know, I, I went and ran a group the next hour and I should not have, but I did. Wow. We've had people who've had their shoulders broken, who've had concussions, who've had their jaws busted. I mean, all kinds of stuff. So I don't want this to be like, oh my God. You know, it, it happens to a lot of people, a lot of people. So, so to, the short answer to your question is yes, I have been scared and I had been preparing for something like that to happen since I, the day I started working there. Yeah. I think that anybody can understand why being attacked at work is traumatizing. And I think that there's a lot of us who can really relate to the idea that you thought you were safe. You thought that there was all of these protocols that would keep you safe and they failed you. Uh, I never, I never thought I was safe. Really? Okay. So, so the whole time you were there, you just didn't feel safe at work, but you, you did this job for how long? I, I was on the unit every day for three years. So and then for upstairs. three years, you went to work and didn't feel safe. And as you know, uh, people like me, people like Michelle Hammer, people that we interview on other shows, we're, we're there three, four, five days and we don't feel safe. And uh, we carry a lot of, whether you call it anger, whether you call it misunderstanding, trauma, whatever, toward the hospital and staff. I, I am listening to what you say and I'm thinking, my God, I would never want to work there. But there's still that part of me that's just like, you were still mean to me. But there should I, be. There right. should be that part of you. And I don't begrudge that anger at all. And not at all. And I would never pretend to say I understand it because I don't. Look, I'm a mental health consumer. I go to therapy, but that's not the same thing. And I would never pretend that being an employee who has keys that jingle jangle at three o'clock and I'm out of here right. is the same thing. But what I will tell you is that I was traumatized long before the assault. I mean, oh. I was, I was take I took a patient down my first hour on the unit. The first hour I was oh. sitting, I was sitting on the, on the acute unit with my trainer. You have a trainer preceptor for, I don't know what it is, two weeks, maybe you're his shadow, you know, for every, every hour you're on the unit. The first hour I'm sitting there with him, just like what happened to me. A staff member put his key in the door to go out. A patient followed him and cold cocked him, hit him right in the back of the head. Immediately, my, my trainer and I jumped up. I had the, the midsection. He had the top, took the patient to the ground. He was a, a Hispanic young man, waited until three or four more other staff members got there, picked him up, put him on a bed, putting him in, in restraints. That's traumatizing for everybody in the room. I can imagine. Everyone. So that, to me, even with the words coming out of my mouth, and I know it's true, it sounds disingenuous. Because you're like, how dare you, staff members, say that you're 
traumatized, you're not the one being put in full leathers. You're not the one being, you know, exposed in this way. No, but you're perpetrating an act that is, um, it seems so draconian. It seems like very 12th century um, to be restraining somebody to a bed. It seems very vulgar and very violent. And it is, it's an act of violence. So what you're, whether you're on the receiving end of that or, or the, the perpetrating act, that's traumatizing. I, I think that there's a lot of analogies that, that would probably fit this situation. And I hate that the one that keeps coming to mind has to do with infants, um, since we're talking about feeling infantilized as a patient. But it, it just sort of reminds me of a parent taking their two-year-old to the doctor to get a shot. And the, the two-year-old understands that this is going to hurt. And the, the parent understands that it's going to hurt. And the doctor understands it's going to hurt. But there's that little bit of disconnect from the two-year-old that's like, why are you allowing this to happen, mom? Why, why won't you take me out of here, dad? And, and the parent is always holding the child down while, you know, the, the treatment is being given, the vaccination or, or whatever it is. And uh, how can you not be affected by that? You just held your kid down when your kid asked you not to. D does that resonate with you? I mean... From my perspective, when I was there, y'all looked like you were enjoying yourselves, which I now know is ridiculous. No, Nobody enjoys themselves there. But at the time, it felt like that. And where's the bridge for that? Obviously, like you said, we can't sit people down and say, listen, it's going to look like the staff is having a good time because they may whistle or they get to go home or they're going to laugh or tell a joke. But really, we're all traumatized, too, because that doesn't really make a patient feel safe either. Right. I, I mean, what's yeah. the goal here? Everybody's miserable. <laughs> Well, here's maybe the that thing. Is the best. Here's the thing. Everybody isn't miserable. So the patients aren't miserable 24 hours a day. Like you will go, you will hear patients laughing and joking with each other and, and having a good time in the activities room or watching a movie. Let's not sell each other a bill of goods on either end that like it's a completely horrendous experience for the patient. It's not. That's true. Uh, I got and, better. I, I got and, better. It saved my life. The staff ain't miserable 24 hours a day either. We like each other. We love each other. There is an incredible bond that happens with employees who are kind of in a first responder environment. And in within the confines of a closed psychiatric hospital, you are the first responders. So you, right. you know, you are the ones running down the hall when there's an emergency. You are the ones leaning on each other. We're hugging in the chart room. We're crying with each other. We get mad and yell at each other. It sounds so cliche, but it is very much like a family. We're not walking around 24 hours a day crying about how horrible it is. We're just not. Because first of all, we wouldn't be able to function. We, we would not be able to do our job if that's how we acted. That's true. We're totally ineffective for the patients and for each other. You know, we, we depended on each other for, for support and to be able to get through hard incidents. Um, and a lot of that was done through humor and very, very black humor, as I think you'll find in, in all hospital environments and first responder environments, that the gallows humor gets you through. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think people are traumatized, but you deal with that in lots of different ways, you know, whether it's through humor, or whether it's through a, a variety of coping mechanisms. Some of them are healthy, some of them are not. <laughs> I, I, I understand what you're saying. I, I, I really, really do. That's really beautiful. Gabe, it thank is. you for being so open and so honest with all of your stories. We really appreciate it. So I know that you no longer work at the psychiatric hospital and you went on to another job, but it still involves a lot of mental health advocacy and empowering people through telling their stories and making movies. Can you talk about the job that you have now and tell people where to find that site? While I no longer work there, um, I, I am still back there every other month or so. It seems like there's always some kind of reason where I'm, I'm back there. And, and that's nice, actually. It's, it's kind of nice not to have the cord completely uh, severed. But where I work now, it is still involved in mental health. It's, it's just not the trenches anymore. I, I'm the editor-in-chief of a mental health publication called OC87 Recovery Diaries. We're at OC87RecoveryDiaries.org. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all over the place. And we publish uh, mental health personal essays and do original mental health documentary films. We have a new essay every week and a new film every month, just really highlighting stories of mental health empowerment and change. I, I want to toot your horn a little bit, Gabe, because, you know, sometimes people hear, you know, we're a website and we make little movies every month. The these aren't little movies. These are very high end, well thought out. They're, they're incredible mini documentaries about various people and things. And uh, they're really quite amazing. Well, I, I love what we do and I love how we do it. And the, the production company that we work with um, for the films calls it giving mental health stories the red carpet treatment. Important to give mental health storytellers 
the respect and dignity of having a professional editor and laying their story out correctly. And same thing with the films. We're going to profile you. We're going to do it right. Well, excellent. Thank you so much. Everybody check that out over at OC87RecoveryDiaries.org. Thank you again. It was great having you. Thanks. Thank you, Vince, for for putting up with both of us. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Remember, you can get one week of free, convenient, affordable, private online counseling anytime, anywhere by visiting BetterHelp.com slash Psych Central. We will see everybody next week. Thank you for listening to The Psych Central Show. Please rate, review, and subscribe on iTunes or wherever you found this podcast. We encourage you to share our show on social media and with friends and family. Previous episodes can be found at psychcentral.com slash show. Psychcentral.com is the Internet's oldest and largest independent mental health website. Psych Central is overseen by Dr. John Grohall, a mental health expert and one of the pioneering leaders in online mental health. Our host, Gabe Howard, is an award-winning writer and speaker who travels nationally. You can find more information on Gabe at gabehoward.com. Our co-host, Vincent M. Wales, is a trained suicide prevention crisis counselor and author of several award-winning speculative fiction novels. You can learn more about Vincent at vincentmwales.com. If you have feedback about the show, please email talkback at psychcentral.com. 